What's up everyone, Tom from the Airsoft headquarters here and welcome back. Today, I'm gonna to be talking about the KWA Ronin 47, both the standard rifle as well as the Drifter edition. So, let's get right into it. Now, for anyone that's been a player of Airsoft for many, many years, like myself, eventually we get to a point where we're kind of bored of the same old M4 or AK platform. In fact, myself, I've been guilty of that same emotion as well. So I personally went onto ebig.com and I purchased one of the challenge kits, specifically the SR47, which by design is going to be a AR based platform that takes AK style of magazines. It's kind of the best of both worlds as far as having a familiar ergonomic or muscle memory of that of the AR platform while having different styles of magazines that could be compatible with any sort of AKs that you have or different AR furniture that you have. So that was pretty sweet. Unfortunately, the SR47 really wasn't to my liking. I personally found it really difficult in order to get magazines to fit inside of that mag well. I know there have been certain agreements as far as with other brands of SR47s that have recently come out onto the market as far as having that frustration of magazines not fitting or it just not overall being to their likeness. So this past SHOT Show, SHOT Show 2020, I was at the KWA booth and before they did any sort of announcements, I saw, actually not this model, not the Drifter edition. I saw the standard rifle edition. Now I saw this, no one pointed out to me as far as a rep, but I saw it over in the corner and I was like, oh, hot damn, what this boy? And so I was playing with it, moving it around, doing some magazine changes, magazine insertions, quick acquisition, swapping shoulders, stuff like that, just overall playing with the rifle that was on the SHOT Show floor. And right away, within 30 seconds of handling, I was like, I gotta get one for myself. I wanted something that's kind of right in the middle as far as being comfortable. I can have a lot of muscle memory as far as transitioning shoulders or moving that selector switch, having the same overall controls of an AR style platform while having different style of magazines. So it just looks different and looks more aggressive. And that is something that I really, really enjoyed. In fact, I think a lot of other players enjoy that same type of overall look that the Ronin 47 has. Now, the more modern Ronin style of rifles or even the QRFs are gonna be coming with a anodized metal orange flash hider. The Rome 47 Drifter Edition would be coming with a bright green accented flash hider that would match both the arms and the trigger of the Drifter Edition. The standard rifle is going to have just black accents, well, not even accents, it's just black coloration everywhere. <laughs> I mean, really, if you think about it, black accented black rifle, it's a thing. I personally took this guy off of my rifle I just put a Tracy unit right on there. But uh, these guys are super easy to take off the KWA rifles period, as well as the QRFs. In fact, of all the other QRF rifles that I have seen, all of them did not have glue. This one had a very light amount of Loctite. And it's like, it was really, really, really light. It was hardly on there. So just by hand, I was able to torque this off. Easy peasy, no problem. I suggest saving your orange tips, that way you can put your orange tip on, making it easier for transportation. And if you do go through any sort of public transportation, these are much easier to put onto rifles so they can be distinguished as airsoft rifles. Public service announcement. If we go down to the rail system, it is the more modern KBWA TML. This is the eight inch edition, which is gonna have M-Lock on the three o'clock and nine o'clock position. It is also on the six o'clock, but it is only for, I would say, three quarters of the entire length. There is the bolt uh, clamp down here, which you won't be able to put any sort of rail accessories on there. And then there is a three slot Picatinny uh, rail system up on the top here on the six o'clock position for any sort of foregrips or angled grips way towards the front there. 
the very top, the 12 o'clock position of the rail system is going to be all Picatinny. And in fact, it has been cut for any sort of weight reduction and it just looks cool overall. There is a, uh, a mock gas tube inside of there. It doesn't actually do any sort of function, but it is a very, very cool touch to an airsoft rifle to just make it look a little bit more realistic. On the top of the rail system is going to be the PTS Imbus flip up iron sights. The very front one is going to have a elevation adjustment as far as up and down. And then the rear one on the back of the receiver is going to have a daytime or nighttime aperture adjustment as well as a left to right adjustment for windage. So those are both flip downs. There's no button press, so you gotta pull them up as well as knock them down whenever they're not in use. Going back, the receiver is a different styling from a standard KBWA M4 style of receiver to fit that larger style of magazine. So that means that if something were to happen or you do want to get this changed out, you have to make sure you get the Ronin 47 style of receiver. This upper will not fit on any sort of other QRF style of lowers and the lower is not compatible with any sort of aftermarket QRF uppers just so that we're completely clear on that. This also features a proprietary hop-up unit, which is going to be the Ronin 47 style specifically. So no upgrades, and you have to make sure you purchase the correct one from KWA's website if anything were to happen. Just so you guys know. Everything so far has been full metal, including all of the pins, all of the bolts, the barrel, the rail, the receiver, all of it is going to be the super thick KWA styling. So this one does have quite a bit of heft, but overall, you know that it's going to be durable and very robust. In fact, I've actually dropped this one, my personal one, a couple of times, and it's held up very well so far. Um, not intentionally, it's all been accident as far as leaning up against something and dropping it. I actually had it up on the table here and it was leaning too far over the edge and dropped. So. Don't mean to give it any sort of durability test, but I am putting it through its ropes by accident. The controls of the magazine release are completely ambidextrous. So when you put the magazine in, it just slides in like a standard M4 style of magazine, and you don't have to rock it in like an AK style of magazine. That's one distinct advantage that I really like about this SR47 style of rifling. So right hand functions, and then slide in so I can prove that the left side, where is it? There we go, also functions as well. The magazine does not drop out, so you do have to give it a yank. My personal favorite is on the very back of the magazine here. There is a MP5 style of magazine release. So it's just hitting it with your thumb and ripping it out. Also, because of ambidextrous, there is going to be an ambidextrous imitation bolt release. So if you pull that charging handle back, pressing upwards on that bolt release with your finger, the right side, as well as the left side here is going to function to slide that forward. Now, while we're talking about the imitation bolt release, underneath that bolt release is going to be a rotary style of hop-up, which, perfect. Rotary style of hop-up units are going to be more advantageous because they are going to be more precise. You also have more control as far as the amount of backspin, that you give that BB as it travels through the inner barrel. So you can be more accurate, more precise, because of the rotary style of hop-up, it's also more robust. So better than these standard ones. Now, like I said, that hop-up unit is proprietary, so no aftermarket upgrades for there. You also have ambidextrous style of selector switches. So this is the PTS, the larger style of paddle. So it is physically taller as far as away from the receiver. So since I am right-handed, it is super easy to get my thumb there getting full controls. Now for the left-hand side, it is a little bit more difficult because the left side or left-handed uh, selector switch is shorter. So it is more difficult for me personally to get my thumb on there to actually get it from semi to safe. That's just something that I have noticed. With the style of selector switches, if you are left-hand based, you can get a super small Allen screw. I think that is a one and a half or a one millimeter uh, Allen screw. So you can take that off, take that off, and then rotate them around. So you can get the larger paddle on here, 
and a smaller one over here if you're left-handed specifically or if you just like that thing. The trigger is going to be the nicer Kid Way moon-shaped or that crescent style of face to the trigger. That is something that I have noticed. It is a very small detail, but it is one that I find very, 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 very comfortable. So thank you, Kid Way. I appreciate, I have noticed. And then if we continue just lower than the trigger, there's the trigger guard. And I know a couple of people like to change their uh, trigger guards out for some more tactical, some more modern base of trigger guards. This one, however, is stuck in place. So if anyone was possibly looking at changing that out, you can't. It is actually one solid piece that is connected to the receiver. So you're stuck with just the trigger guard as it is. So unfortunately, no options there. You're stuck with it as is. So the PTS Enhanced Polymer Grip, compact style specifically, allows for a more vertical position of the hand. So as I'm shooting, I can get myself in a smaller profile like so, versus if I were to go with the grip that is the standard with the beaver tail accent. That is the type of grip that I like specifically featured on this rifle specifically. It does not have a vertical or a more vertical position, so the grip is angled slightly backwards, which, I mean, it's very, very slight, but it is noticeable as far as a shooter's platform that my elbow has to go out a little bit more as far as that grip. Again, it is one of those smaller details, but it is something that people do notice, especially when they're holding it, that they can get a much tighter profile with this style of grip. And then if we continue farther backwards, there is a left and a right hand sling point on the back of the receiver here, which is metal, not any sort of polymer, cheapo one. So very, very nice to see that. I have seen some of the polymer ones break from a couple different other companies. So it is always, always a great option to get metal sling plates if you only have the polymer ones. Upgrade to metal. And then the same type of stock, or at least uh, collapsing stock that is on the QRF style of rifles, there is going to be the short compact collapsible stock that is this. This one I believe is called the Tanker Edition. It features the same checkerboard pattern that is on the grip as well as on the Imbus flip up iron sights. So awesome to have a continuation of themes and patterns across the rifles. Now this one specifically has a little bit of a tang here or a bevel. And for me personally, I find that that's a little bit better to put into the shoulder and rotate that rifle up um, versus some of the other QRF models, which feature a cup instead of the tang. So for me personally, I like it in the furthest out position, but if you press the button down on the bottom of the stock here, there is a middle position and then an all the way down position. Now I find that the all the way down position is very difficult to actually do any sort of tactical movement. So I think that this would be very good as far as having it in a gun bag or maybe in a super stealthy backpack if you're doing any sort of themed events. You can have this tucked away hidden with a magazine in a pocket or something and then pull it out, shink, shoom. That is one thing that uh, you do not need to press the button in if you need the stock to eject. You need to push the button in in order to get that to slide forward. So with one hand, I can pull it out, but I need one hand to hit that button. Now, Evic, Doc, Evic Matt did make a note that the uh, slide itself did make a weird noise. That's not present on mine, nor is it present on the Drifter Edition here. So I think that's just the one that he has. Uh, they don't always come with a squeak because he made that note and I was like, I don't remember mine having a squeak. And so both of these don't squeak. So unfortunately, if you get it, I think it just requires a little bit of a wear in. If yours does not come with a squeak, then 
Good. And then to take the stock all the way off, press that button in, pull it all the way off. There's a button towards the 12 o'clock position that you would press in, and that takes the end cap off. And inside your small battery space is going to be a Dean's style of connector, which it's lost in here. There it is. So a Dean's connector. Awesome. Dean's I am finding are becoming more and more standardized on some of the higher end style of rifles, which is awesome because Dean's is the better connector from Tamiya. Um, if you don't already have a Dean's connectors, you should try to swap your Tamiya out to a Dean's with a trained professional, of course. Don't try to do any sort of solder work yourself if you do not know how to do it. Another public service announcement. Um, another thing as well is that back here, there is going to be a small little automotive fuse. So if anything does short out, I actually had this at Operation Iron Fury where a uh, squad member's rifle did cut the fuse and then we were spending a couple hours trying to figure out what's wrong with the rifle, some with the motor, something with the hop up, some with the gearbox, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera when really it was just a $2 fuse. So if you guys do, so if you guys do run across any sort of issues, make sure that is one of the things that you look at on your checklist. So getting it all back together is as simple as putting that cap back on, taking your sling, pressing that button in and sliding the stock all the way down forward and it's as simple as that and that is what we have for an overall overview for the kid Ronin 47 now the drifter edition is the exact same type of overall setup with the addition that it comes with a green accented stock arms trigger and it comes i mean it's going to come in the box with an orange flash hider as is federal regulation but it does ship with a bright green flash hider. If you do pick up the T1 or the tier one drifter edition, it also comes with a hoodie, a t-shirt with Velcro on the patches. So if you wanted to, or it has Velcro on the sleeves for your patches, almost said that backwards and almost didn't catch myself. Uh, also comes with a mask during these COVID times. Also comes with a sticker and a large Ronin 47 collectible patch that you can throw right onto that sleeve. So that is what you would get for the Drifter Edition. But if you want to get just the rifle, the rifle is retailing $355. And then the tier one Drifter Edition does come at $465 if you want to get everything that is included with that. Just so you guys are aware. So the KWA Ronin 47 features an AEG 2.5 gearbox, which is KWA's adjustable velocity gearbox. It is not a quick change spring gearbox. Instead, it features a spring guide that sits towards the back of the spring and it adjusts the amount of tension that is put onto the spring before the gearbox is actually engaged. So with the tool that comes inside the gearbox, this four millimeter, three millimeter uh, Allen wrench, if you go in through the back of the stock, you would be able to take your adjustment tool, push it inwards, make those adjustments as far as more tension or less tension, resulting in a higher velocity or a lower velocity. So for my rifle, personally, this one does shoot at 355 feet per second at the lowest setting. Now, with KWA, types of rifles, they do come out of the box at a higher velocity. So it does require some wear in before you get to that ideal spring tension. So you would need to put, I would estimate about 200 rounds or 400 rounds into the gearbox before that spring starts to actually wear in. And actually it's more advantageous if you shoot the rifle before you actually get to a field because all of the KWA rifles are going to be coming with silicone oil inside that hop up unit as well as inside the gearbox, just preserve any of those O-rings or any of those buckings or rubber parts, just to make sure that everything is in good operable position when it arrives to you. So you would need to shoot all of that silicone oil out of the hop-up unit anyway, because if there is oil on the bucking, you're not able to get any sort of backspin from the BB. So 
you're going to see some sort of fluctuation. In fact, there was some sort of fluctuation when I was doing the T10 review, when I was doing the shooting test, which we'll do a shooting test about this, don't worry. Um, I was doing the shooting test on the T10 and as I'm shooting the BBs, as I'm doing the 100 foot uh, accuracy test, that is the point where the silicone oil started to get shot out. And so I was, I had set the hop up to where with the oil in the hop up unit, the BBs were shooting straight, but then all of a sudden they start over hopping like crazy because that oil is outside the hop up unit and that bucking can actually sit against the top of the BB and give it back spin. So <laughs> those test results weren't actually accurate. So I'm going to do the smart thing and actually shoot a couple rounds or a couple of magazines before I actually do the accuracy test, both to get the spring settled for this one specifically, as well as get that oil shot out. But since I did already open this little baggie from Kid UA, they do include the female connector for any sort of Dean's connector. So if you have a spare LiPo battery, ideally an 11-1 to give you the best results, both as far as trigger response and rate of fire at the higher velocity or higher tension inside that gearbox. So they do provide that as well as two M-Lock rail mounts if you guys did want to put any sort of accessories on the bottom of the rail system or the sides. I already got extras of the M-Lock rail system, so I actually did not pull mine from the Roman 47. So this is actually going to go into my parts area. And then here is the warranty card and a Kid UA sticker if you guys do need to use this. Of course, if you do purchase these from a local shop, make sure that you do take advantage of the shop's warranty before you try to contact Kid UA. Just to make sure that there's no extended warranty or any sort of special deals that that local shop provided to you guys. Anyway. We're gonna put this through the chronograph and then we're gonna go do a shooting test. All right, here we go. Lowest tension. All right. So not the greatest as far as the lowest tension on mine personally. I know the EVIC crew did get some lower velocities with theirs. Like I said, I did predict that we would probably need to wear this in just a little bit but I'm gonna crank this sucker all the way up and we'll see exactly what my highest velocity is. We'll see if I can hit DMR status. Jeez, I'm just twisting, 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 twisting. Any second, any second, I think I'm gonna be able to max it out. Right there, there's the max. Test shot. Ooh, still snappy. With a max of 411.8 feet per second. So still, wow, over 400 feet per second. And with that snappy of a response. Here, let me back this up so you guys can actually see. In fact, let's see what my rate of fire is. Still at 19.5, 20 feet or 20 rounds per second. I know at my uh, lowest tension, I was ripping about 22, 23. But at 400 feet per second with 20 rounds a second, that's, that's pretty good. But I'm going to bring that velocity back down. So give me just a sec and I'll be able to... Uh, probably just a minute and I'll be able to get this down to that lower velocity. All right, so room 47, I've got the stock in the outward most position because my battery is sticking out just a little bit. I need to get some super small compact ones, but yeah, now I've got it in a complete figuration. Now I just gotta rip a couple mags through to get all of that oil shot out as well as the spring nice and warmed up. Bam. 
All right, let's see if you can watch this rip. Wow, that's a lot of rotation. See what I mean about the, uh, the BBs hopping upwards? Oh, didn't mean to lock that backwards. But man, you've got a lot of adjustments as far as points of pressure, as far as like there's clicks, there's a lot of clicks. Way more than I think anything else I've seen on the market. That's like, you got a lot of room for adjustment with this hop up, wow. I think that's good right there. You know what? I'm just using the red dot, whatever. I've got it mounted. It's not actually sighted in for anything. And then just so you guys know, I put you about halfway, so you should be able to see the tracer BBs light up, but I am back here for 100 feet. And through the red dot, that is super hard to distinguish. So we're just gonna, we're gonna give her the old send. And that was it. All right, so we're back inside. And first of all, corner results, impressive. As expected with the higher velocity, but overall very impressive, especially with a short barrel as it is. Normally we see that over velocity with those longer barrels that have more room for that BB to catch up to speed. But with the shorter little PDW type of barrel that we have here, awesome. And the fact that it was ripping at that higher velocity, awesome. Way to go, KWA. Yes. Not that I would overshoot anyone at over velocity limits. That's a big no, no. We don't do that. That's a no. Oh my God, the fact that it just ripped still gives me chills. Okay, so 25 feet using 0.25 tracers because it's getting dark and I wanted you guys to see exactly where those impacts were. So at 25 feet, Kind of just aiming for the head with the red dot that I threw on there from a different uh, rifle. Um, so it really wasn't set up for this PDW, nor is it actually sighted in. So just sent it. But the fact that the five shots landed within a three inch distance, pretty solid. And then at the 50 feet, another five shots, just impacting to the left. My point of aim for 25 was at the head. My point of aim for the 50 was dead center. And then at 100, I was trying to hold right of center mass with the expectations that the BBs were going to actually impact for the left uh, because of the lack of actual calibration from the optic to the rifle. So totally expected and I did compensate, just a heads up. But of that 100 shot or 100 foot distance, we had two out of the five impact the target. The other two actually went just right. And then the other one was a little bit farther down here. And then I heard the final shot impact just miss the cardboard, but it did impact the wall right behind there. So it did impact farther off this way. So I know about the grouping size of this 100 foot was almost double of the 100 foot, which overall, that is really, really good. Again, especially because of that shorter PDW type of system with that barrel, doesn't really have the length in order to get that BB up to speed, nor to get it really centered inside of that inner barrel for optimal consistency. Overall, really good, especially with a 0.25 gram. Awesome. One quick note, while I was ripping it on full auto, uh, the motor did get slightly warm, not to the point where it was burning my hand, uh, but that really only started heating up when I was ripping it on full auto, really overworking that system, getting that motor worked up. Just so you guys are aware, if you do plan on running this full auto, that is going to be an effect. 
The resolution is going to be to go inside of there and do what is called a shim job, where I would be aligning the gears to fit in perfect synchronization to minimize the amount of wear and tear as well as, well as making it as smooth as possible to get as much efficiency as possible. That way, if I were to do a perfect shim job, I would rip it with an 11.1, probably at 25, 26 rounds per second with the stock high torque motor. And if I did wanna get better results, I probably could go with a tight bore inner barrel. Now, here comes my overall rating on a 10 point scale. Now, if I were to give this on a 10 point grading scale, I would give the Ronin 47 in an honest opinion, a seven out of 10. Why would I give it a seven out of 10? Well, starting back here, I personally think that the battery space isn't big enough. Now I understand that they went for a small compact PDW style of stock and that's fine. I know that there are batteries on the market that will fit inside of this stock. In fact, here in the store, we have some for sale that will fit in here. My issue is that I personally don't have any of those batteries and because I like to run the stock all the way out, I feel like that battery space could have been optimized so I wouldn't have to run a battery outside of the stock here or possibly have to get different batteries. The other thing was, uh, while the motor does warm up, there is a solution or resolution as far as how to fix that. It is not end of the world. In fact, is fairly normal, especially with the uh, higher torque type of motors and ripping at higher velocities on full auto. The other big thing that everyone is gonna gripe about and already are with previous SR47s is that they are not compatible with other styles of magazines. With the evic.com challenge kit or other brand of SR47s, it was very easy to argue and say that, well, there are plenty of other brands of AK magazines that are available. And really there are going to be a handful of players that are on the field that will be running AKs if you really need to pull a magazine from your buddy. The fact that it's not an M4 magazine, you can get over that. So the issue becomes that these are proprietary size and dimensions of magazines. So you would have to find someone that is also running, running a Ronin 47 in order to get any sort of buddy mags from him. That's an issue because these are so new to the market and magazines are fairly limited as far as where they are in different distribution centers or stores. Uh, so if you really think you need four magazines for your carrier, probably get six just to make sure, uh, especially with the current environment of the airsoft industry being it is harder for manufacturers to manufacture products. So get these while you can. Another thing is while it was super awesome to rip it at 100 feet, there was a slight issue as far as not being the tightest grouping, which I can honestly live with. I mean, at 100 feet, the grouping size being, oh, I would say eight inches, nine inches. So that's not horrible. And in fact, I'm not gonna be running this as a DMR. My intention is actually to run this as a close quarters type of setup because that's what it is built to do. It is super compact. So at 100 feet, I really think that's going to be the end all be all engagement distance. And I really don't expect a 2.5 to really be shooting lasers. Now I can easily spam the trigger on semi-automatic if I really need to get those super fast follow-up shots, either at that 25 foot distance, which we saw the grouping at 25 feet. It was really solid. If I really need to reach someone out at 100 feet with close quarters, that's really not a distance that I think I would see. But if I do have to reach 100 feet or even further than that, I really like the idea that I would have full controls over the amount of rotations and the amount of pressure that the rotary style pop-up would give me. Like I was saying before, I had to click it a lot to get it to where the bees were actually hopping. And in fact, even though I ripped through three and a half magazines, 
um, that still was not enough for that silicone oil inside of the hop-up unit to completely clear out. So we did see right away that the BBs were rising right away because I put that hop-up unit all the way on and it finally cleared out that silicone oil. So make sure you shoot four or five magazines before you hit the airsoft field, as well as make sure you take the time to really dial that hop-up unit in because this hop-up unit gives you all of the controls. Like that is awesome that they give you that many clicks. It was really shocking to sit there and just click, 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 and just keep rotating that dial. It's like, God, when is this going to end? Oof. Anyway, we got it to work and it works phenomenally. I'm so happy that I was actually hyping this up so much here in the store and that I actually got it and it performs better than expected. In complete honesty, better than expected, even based off of, well, my expectations were based off of the previous QRF style of rifles, the Mod 1, the Mod 2, the T6, as well as the T10 that I had purchased. So uh, my expectations were based on those, and the Ruin 47 surpassed it. So really, I would give this a 7 out of 10 for being more critical of those different points, but it actually fared better, I think. But just me being overly critical. Anyway, you guys let me know what you would think if you were to rate this on a 10 point scale and why. Put it down in the comments section below. As always guys, thank you for staying to the end of the video. Please consider subscribing, liking, hitting the notification bell if you really want, or check out any of the other videos that I have here on the channel. Of course, you guys stay safe, stay clean, stay positive, and I will see you in the next one. Take care.